Many of us should be aware of the fact that water purification is a very important issue in all societies. And certainly here in Southern California, desalination is growing in, in regional importance. So we're really looking forward to this presentation. Jim will speak for about 40 minutes and we'll then have uh, time for questions. You can insert your questions in the Q&A box. And as time permits, I'll call on you. With that, Jim, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, David. And, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, to talk to your group. It's, uh, it's a great topic for me to, to go out and talk to other groups because it's not mainstream material science, as you can see. It's, uh, it's really more to do with water and gases than solids, although our application has to do a lot with solids, and that's how I got interested in this. Um, I'm particularly pleased to have Bill Cooper uh, on this webinar because uh, Bill, while he was uh, director of the Urban Water Research Institute here, uh, was actually instrumental in me getting involved in this, although he probably didn't know that. Um, before recently. But um, Bill, thank you. Thank you for being here. And I hope you have weathered the storms down there in Florida. Uh, well, I, I haven't heard anything about your situation, but I hope it what wasn't too bad. All right. So with that, um, what I like to do when I start a talk on nanobubbles is um, show a couple of pictures. This is a couple of beakers uh, that uh, have uh, water in them. One of them has nanobubbles uh, in the water and one does not. And I always like to ask, uh, you know, get a raise of hands uh, for which one you think it is. Is it T or is it C? And I won't do that with the Zoom, um, but it is uh, T that has the nanobubbles, even though C has some macroscopic bubbles and you, got, you can actually see it, it is in the water. C is for control. That means there's no nanobubbles there. Uh, T is for test. And if I shine a laser pointer through those two beakers at the same time, you'll see in the beaker with nanobubbles, and this is after two days of creating the nanobubbles, uh, you can see a trace, a clearly defined trace through the beaker. It's actually on the other side of where the laser pointer is. Uh, I'm shining it from, the, from your right side and through both beakers. And you can see the trace pretty clearly in the beaker label T and not so clearly with the other beakers. So you can see that the nanobubbles are scattering light if it's collimated and from a laser. But in diffuse light, very difficult to see them. You can't really see those uh, bubbles that are so small. And so uh, after 16 days, you can do the same thing. And lo and behold, you can still see that trace. So the nanobubbles, um, one, one characteristic about nanobubbles, very interesting, very useful, I think, is that they persist for a long time. Um, some people e has, have even claimed months, and I've seen evidence of that, too, in, with some of the nanobubbles we create. They are very, very stable in water, and they do not, they're not that buoyant. Uh, their motion is primarily determined by charges in the water, and we'll get into that a little later. So you might be wondering... Well, why is a, how is a guy in material science and engineering involved in research on something like this? Well, this is how it started. Um, we were conducting research at Three Mile, sorry, Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Station at the time. This was many years ago. This is before they shut the whole thing down. And uh, actually, it's now being resurrected to go back into operation. Uh, one, one of, they, there was actually two nuclear reactors on the site. One was closed down after the accident. One continued running for many years and was actually one of the most successful problem-free reactors in the country. And they were very progressive and they were willing to work with us on uh, bacteria that we were working on that could actually protect the uh, pipes in a system like this from corrosion. The problem that they had though uh, was, was very difficult and as far as I know, they still haven't overcome it. I'm going to be trying to talk to them about what we're doing in the not too distant future. But um, they had this problem with their secondary cooling water system. That system basically took in uh, river water. Uh, Three Mile Island is actually on a river. And uh, they bring in water from the river and they uh, use it in their secondary cooling water system, which cools the primary system, which has pristine treated water, you know, uh, 
very clean water that goes into the nuclear part of the plant. But that system has to be cooled by the secondary system, and it just has coarse filtered river water. And um, these tubercles can form on the pipes in that secondary system. And once they form, uh, they are very tenacious. This is actually after they tried to remove the tubercles by, um, on a, in, during a routine shutdown of the plant. They, they took spheres with sandpaper on them. They flushed them through the system to knock the tubercles off. But that, as you can see, it didn't really do much in terms, in terms of removing them. And this is the problem that they create eventually is that these tubercles get colonized by bacteria that can induce corrosion. The upper parts of the tubercle are typically colonized by aerobic bacteria. Um, they consume the oxygen coming in, diffusing in the tubercle. And then at the bottom, there's typically anaerobic bacteria like sulfate reducing bacteria uh, that can thrive down there because there's very little oxygen as a result. And um, the sulfate reducing bacteria create iron sulfide. And the iron for, for the iron sulfide comes from the pipe wall. And so as you can see, you tend to get this localized corrosion, and eventually uh, the bacteria will eat through the pipe wall, and then you have a leak and you have to shut down the system. Very expensive. Here's another pipe that had this problem. Um, the, the localized corrosion was actually going down a weld seam for the pipe, the one weld seam that the pipe had. Um, bacteria are very efficient. They always uh, colonize where they get the, where they can get the fastest corrosion going, the most iron sulfide producing, and at the well seam, it's weaker there, and so that was a susceptible region for localized corrosion, and they were just going down that well seam, and so what the operators decided to do was to weld a bead on the outside of the pipe just to extend the life of that pipe a little longer, but eventually, uh, as you can see, they had to remove it. So this was a big problem there, and there really wasn't any way to solve the problem uh, while we were working with them on this. Now about that time, I happened to be in the Office of Research. I was Associate Vice Chancellor there. And I went to the Canadian Consulate in Los Angeles and I met a, a, a couple of guys from a company in Irvine. Uh, and they had a water treatment system that they were talking to people in Canada about. And, and so they were there. And, and so since they were from Irvine, I of course wanted to find out what they were doing. And they mentioned that, you know, they, they have uh, their water treatment system in 36 different golf courses in Southern California. And uh, they could demonstrate that if you use their system in the irrigation, you can grow greener grass with less water. And uh, they could demonstrate that and they could convince greenskeepers, who are typically very conservative people, uh, that this is uh, something they should lease. And, and so they were doing that. And I, I thought, well, I need to introduce these guys to Bill Cooper because he's the director of our water center, he should know about this. So I set up a lunch uh, with me and Bill and these guys, and they presented what they were doing, and it was a, it was had to do with a magnetic water treatment. And I didn't know at the time there were, I guess there were a lot of uh, people claiming that magnetic water treatments were beneficial for some reason or another, but these guys didn't seem to know why it was working the way it was, and Bill didn't seem too interested in it at the time. But there was one photograph, and it's this one down in the right-hand corner that I saw while they were talking that really intrigued me. Uh, they said that whenever they install one of their systems on the irrigation lines, they have to remove the sprinkler heads for a while to flush out this debris that comes out. And after a couple of days, all the debris comes out, and it's fine. You don't, you don't have to take the sprinkler heads off anymore. So anyway, I looked at this debris, and I thought, well, the only place for that debris to come from is from the pipe walls. It must have been uh, fouling the pipe walls before it came out. And somehow the system was able to get that to come out. All right. And I thought about Three Mile Island. So I asked the engineer at Three Mile Island if he could send a pipe sample and some water. And I asked the company that these guys were with in Irvine if they would, wouldn't mind helping me build a proof of concept uh, experiment to test this with pipes from Three Mile Island. So Bill, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have got, ever gotten into this area at all. So thank you for doing that. And uh, I, I appreciate you coming to lunch with us, even though you didn't follow up with them. And I understand why you didn't. Um, so we set up this proof of concept. And uh, the pipe that uh, was sent was in service for 30 years. It had a lot of tubercle deposit on it. They sent it wet. 
and and uh, and they also sent uh, two two carboys, I think, of water from the secondary water system. So we used their water. We set up two different test systems, two flow loop systems, one without their treatment, one with their treatment. We cut this the pipe into two sections. We put w one piece in each of the flow loops and ran, started running the flow loops, one with the treated water, one without treated water, to see what would happen. And so after 48 hours, we looked at the two systems, and uh, this is a, an aquarium that we used it as an expansion tank for one of the flow loops that had their system. This is their AMF, I call it AMF, it's alternating magnetic field, and I'll explain why later. And you can see that the water was fairly clear here. It was not, you know, didn't look too, too bad. Here's the water in the control system, and this is how it came. This is, this is exactly how the water looked when it came from Three Mile Island. It was rusty colored. So, and so we took some of the water out, and sure enough, it looked like you could almost drink the treated water. This is only after 48 hours of this AMF treatment. Um, we looked at the pipe samples, again, after 48 hours. Well, the control pipe looked exactly the same, still had the same amount of deposit on it that it had when we put it in. The treated pipe looked a lot different, though. It had a different color on the inside. And if you go back to, uh, let's go back and I'll show you. If you remember, there was a change in color. As you get down to where the sulfate reducing bacteria producing iron sulfide, the color changes to a gray color. Here's another example. Well, this is the gray color I was seeing on the inside of that pipe. So we were down, I knew we were down close to the substrate of the metal at this point. There's only this one little nodule that was left from the tubercle that sat on that pipe. So this is, this is pretty dramatic. I thought, wow, I don't know what this is doing, but this is really interesting. And in the expansion tank, uh, in the treated water, there was all this, there was this pile of debris that had formed, apparently from the pipe wall that had just fallen off. I thought, wow, this is this is something that's really, really uh, dramatic, and I need to find out what's going on here. So I started to talk to people on campus about it um, because it was clear that the people at this company didn't really understand what they were doing to the water. Uh, they said they were creating more energy in the water. Uh, but that that was about it. You know, that's about their best explanation for what was going on. So I I, um, I eventually got Ru Chin Wu in physics uh, involved, Professor Ru Chin Wu, and we started talking about this. And he suggested, you know, I think they may be creating nanobubbles. Now, I didn't know what a nanobubble was at that point. And so I started looking into it. And... Uh, the one thing I did know about this system is that the water that flows through it does undergo a, an alternating magnetic field. Uh, it's got permanent magnets that are arranged in such a way so that when flowing water comes through there, the water molecules experience a, a, a magnetic field that's oscillating, right? Depending on the flow rate, that'll determine your oscillation frequency. So the flow rate's very important. Um, and, and that's all this was doing. No chemicals were added, and you don't have to supply any power to this. The flow of the water itself provides the kinetic energy for this, right? Anything that's going on here is driven by the kinetic energy of the water. There's no other power input. So that's pretty good because that's energy passive, right? If you've got flowing water already, you don't have to add any more energy to this, really. Um... So I started to look into the literature for how this thing might be creating nanobubbles. And I actually found some papers that did suggest, even some that suggested that nanobubbles could be created by a pulsed magnetic field or um, an alternating electric field. The electric field is also a way you could generate bubbles, apparently, in water. And the explanations were that uh, if you expose water to these fields, they're oscillating, you can affect the hydrogen bomb bonds in a way 
that will destabilize dissolved gases in the water so that they'll precipitate out as bubbles. Okay. And that, you know, I didn't know a lot about water chemistry then. I, you know, I still don't know a lot about water chemistry. At the time, I thought water was pretty well understood, liquid. Uh, I, you know, we do, we do uh, get exposure to liquids in material science uh, when we talk about molten uh, metals and things like that. We solidify materials from molten liquids, but I didn't have any real experience with water. But this seemed like, you know, this was possible. And I thought, well, this might be how this is working if it's creating uh, nanobubbles, whatever those are. So then I started looking into what nanobubbles are, and I was kind of horrified. But I did find that if we take deionized water and we run it through this AMF system, I can get this effect with the laser pointer. This is called the Tyndall effect, and it's what I showed you in the beginning. So, and people were reporting that this, this is what nanobubble containing water does. The problem though, and the horrific part of it, is there was no real good theory for why nanobubbles should exist. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism out there in the literature, it was pretty evident. Uh, a lot of people didn't believe they could exist. Um, and there's a good reason for that. The other thing I wanted to mention though, is in addition to doing this Tyndall effect test, we also measured the zeta potential of deionized water that we ran through this thing. And it was in, uh, it was about minus 36 millivolts. And we did three replicates and we were pretty convinced that's, that's what the, D, the zeta potential is for this. And uh, of course, if you, don't, if you don't treat the water, we don't get anything for deionized water for, the, for this uh, zeta potential measurement. This was done with an Anton Parr uh, uh, instrument. And so um, I looked up in the literature, yep, that's what the nanobubble should have in terms of a zeta potential. So that was also evidence that this thing was creating nanobubbles. But I couldn't find a good theory for why nanobubbles should exist. There's other conventional uh, gener nanobubble generation methods that were already out there. Um, people were using, uh, this is one we have in my lab now. It's a uh, it's uh, what I call dissolved gas decompression. You put water in, in a container. This is actually a modified seltzer bottle. Uh, you put gas pressure on top of that water, 100 PSI is, is enough. And then you release the water out a small orifice and tube and micro bubbles are produced. The water comes out cloudy. And um, after the micro bubbles shrink, they actually shrink at below a certain size then the water gets clear and that's when you have nanobubbles okay here's another uh method for making them this is called a nakuni pump it's made by a, comp a company called nakuni in japan they have an american division now that are creating these pumps specifically for generating nanobubbles uh, and they have they can show you that, that you can put different gases in the nanobubbles and create nanobubbles with different gases in them and so you if you take nanobubbles from those types of techniques, this is from the seltzer bottle, uh, that, you know, this dissolved gas decompression, you do get the zeta potential in this range of minus 30 to minus 40 millivolts, which you'd expect for, for nanobubbles in deionized, deionized water. So the problem is this. Macroscopic bubbles, as we know, are just buoyant. They go up to the surface and they, go, they dissipate at the surface typically. A micro bubble below 50 micrometers in diameter shrinks. Okay, the reason why it shrinks is that that size or smaller, the surface tension pressure is high enough to push the gas back out in, into solution. So the bubble shrinks, the gas goes away. And, um, and so most people who observe this, and we're going to look at it in a minute, thought that these micro bubbles just shrink, shrink to annihilation because the surface tension pressure uh, is only going to increase as the bubble gets smaller. So here's some uh, micro bubbles here. This is a video of micro bubbles shrinking. You can see that it looks like they just go away. They go away to nothing, right? Here's another replay of that. Okay, micro bubbles, and they're shrinking, right? This is observable in the optical microscope, no problem. The explanation for this is provided by the young Laplace equation. 
where you can see for equilibrium pressure of a bubble, you've got internal pressure, you've got external pressure, and then you have this surface tension pressure here, okay? And again, when the bubble is less than 50 micrometers in diameter, that surface tension pressure is high enough to start pushing the gas providing this out. And the surface tension pressure, you can see this is the surface tension here, gamma, divided by the diameter of the bubble. So it goes up by one over the diameter of the bubble. And it's negative because it's compressing the bubble, making it smaller, okay? This was the conventional theory at the time I started working on this. Um, there was no way to explain why nanobubbles should exist. So I fortunately at that time had a graduate student from India, uh, Patrick Saputi, who had a really good background in chemistry and physics. And I started talking to him about this, and he got excited and interested in it, and he wanted to work on it. And I said, okay, let's, let's work on a theory for this. All right, and so we did. Um, for some reason, my slide's not advancing. Let me try this way. Okay, there it goes. All right, so again, nanobubbles were observed by several research groups. Uh, there were a lot of groups in Japan for some reason. I'm not sure why so many groups are working on this in Japan, but a lot of groups in Japan were working on, on what they were calling nanobubbles. Um, and they were reporting that nanobubbles tend to be around 20, mi 20 nanometers to one micrometer in diameter. Uh, and they can be stable for many days. They were already seeing this uh, stability, long-term stability. Um, and the nanobubbles were typically uh, negatively charged, as I showed you with the zeta potential. And a lot of people were attributing to this to um, OH ions, which are negatively charged. In deionized water, that's about all you've got in the water that's negatively charged. So that kind of made sense to me. And, uh, and also that's interesting about the nanobubbles is they repel each other so they don't coalesce. They don't you know, come together and make bigger bubbles because they're, they're repelling each other because they're, they're all negatively charged. And you know, a lot of people were reporting this minus 30, minus 40 millivolt zeta potential for them. And as a matter of fact, uh, Takahashi, as you can see here, did a study where he measured the zeta potential for uh, smaller and smaller micro bubbles. And you can see that the zeta potential doesn't really change in neutral water. It stays within that, you know, minus 30, minus 40 millivolt range. So that's kind of interesting. That was kind of interesting. You know, the zeta potential doesn't change. Whatever's on the surface of the bubble doesn't seem to be going away as it gets smaller. All right, so we started looking at how OH ions could be doing this. And turns out, uh, not long before this, uh, there were some publications which showed that OH ions actually have a huge affinity to gas water interfaces. Uh, they will knock other ions like chlorine ions off the surface, off the gas water interface to get there. And this was being reported uh, Bayan Hersfeld, as you can see there in, in the third bullet, attributed this strong affinity to suppression of dipole mo moment fluctuations by the ions and the reduction of the loss of hydrogen bonds compared to water molecules at the interface. So there was a, a lot of literature and evidence to support the idea that OH ions have a much lower energy at a gas water interface and they want to stay there. So we introduced another term to the young Laplace equation. And this is a pressure due to the repulsion between ions on the surface of the bubble. We, we started doing calculations of what you would expect in terms of concentration of OH ions on a nanoscale bubble. And it turns out that you really don't get enough ions to do anything. Uh, they're not close enough together on the nanobubble to repel each other. Therefore, you don't get stability. But 
Ironically and counterintuitively, if you take a micro bubble and calculate how many ions it has on its surface and then shrink it by about 100 to 1,000 times, you'll find out that the ions that you start out with start to get really close together and they start to repel each other. And so that was our theory. That became our theory that it was the microbubble shrinkage itself, the thing that made it counterintuitive that nanobubbles could be stable, that actually leads to the stabilization of the nanobubble. And one thing that was nice for me as a material scientist is that the ions, as they get closer together, should naturally form a closed packed array. Now, we have lots of closed packed arrays in material science, in crystal structures. And I knew how to treat a closed packed array uh, of atoms, or in this case, ions, that had forces between them. And uh, the force, of course, here results from the Coulomb charge that each ion has. And we could calculate what this repulsion pressure is. And if you work through the, the math, you will find that the repulsion pressure, I'll just skip to this last result because this is really the important result. I can go through these other equations if you like, but I just want to show you this result here at the bottom. That repulsion pressure goes up by one over the diameter of the bubble to the fourth power. Okay, so that means it's going to catch up with the surface tension pressure because the surface tension pressure goes up by one over the diameter. So, uh, so that was great. So we did some calculations, and lo and behold, you do get that this repulsion pressure will balance the surface tension pressure in the range of bubble sizes that were being observed for nanobubbles. The largest of which should be about 1,100 nanometers because that corresponds to starting out with a 50 micrometer na uh, micro bubble. If the micro bubble is larger than this, it won't shrink. Surface tension pressure is not high enough. But if it's this size or smaller, it will shrink to the nanoscale. And according to our theory, it should stop shrinking because of the re repulsion pressure at about 1,100 nanometers. Okay. So first thing I wanted to do when we just when we saw this is see if there was any experimental uh, data to confirm this, and it turns out there is. This is a, some data from a group in Japan uh, who did uh, zeta sizer nano measurements. This is a, a light scattering technique. They were measuring, they could measure the zeta potential, they could also measure the size of the nanobubbles with this instrument. And um, it's a light scattering uh, method. It uses a CCD camera, and um, they measured the distribution of nanobubbles produced by a large um, uh, diverse uh, microbubble uh, distribution. So they would start out making uh, microbubbles, they wait for the microbubbles to shrink, and then they would make these measurements of the nanobubbles. Okay, and these are the average of 10 replicates for them. Um, the mean microbubble diameter they start with is, was 56 micrometers, so even above the 50 micrometers in size, but anything larger than 50 micrometers won't shrink, so it won't form a nanobubble, according to our theory. And if you look at the maximum size here, this is after, just after production, it maxed out right about at 1,000 nanometers. A little bit later, 24 hours later, you can see you know, it's right around 1,100 where you would expect from our theory. So that was pretty good confirmation. I thought that was pretty excited with that. Then we found another paper. This is by a group, another group in Japan, different group. They created uh, nanobubbles the same way with a large distribution of micro bubbles. Um, but in this case, instead of measuring using a, a scattering, light scattering technique, they use freeze fracture replicas. And freeze fracture replicas are, are um, really <laughs> difficult to make. You have to have a very expensive machine to make them. Um, but basically what, the, what is done is you freeze a water a droplet with, in this case, nanobubbles in it instantly in, inside this machine. 
And while the droplet is frozen, a wedge comes in, fractures the droplet, and then replica films are made on the fracture surfaces of that droplet. And then the replicas are taken out, put in the transmission electron microscope, and, and what, whatever was inside that droplet is then observed in the transmission electron microscope. And so they measured um, these nanobubble sizes, these black circles, and it, the agreement was so good with the other data that I just showed you that they actually plotted that data as well. So this is actually the data from uh, this Ushikobo study that they plotted along with it because they said, oh, look, you know, we got very good consistent results with theirs. And again, the maximum was right around what we predicted with our theory. So I was really happy with this. I thought we must be onto something here. And the other thing about our theory is there's no uh, fudge factors. It's all based on first principles physics. Uh, the, the number of ions that you calculate, that you start out initially on the micro bubble, you can get fairly accurately with the um, pH of the water and the Debye length. And uh, so it's a, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. So I was really happy with this because we had, a, I thought, a really good theory for why these things um, exist and why they're so stable and why they last so long. Because if you look at our prediction, you know, the pressures balance, these two pressures balance at really high pressures. This is in the megapascal range here. So, you know, it takes a lot of, it would take a lot of pressure, external pressure to destabilize these things, right? So, uh, and that was actually one of the um, criticisms of our paper and when I explained to them you know, look, yeah, you can put a lot of pressure on these things, nothing will happen, but look at where they're balancing at. After I rebutted that comment, we got accepted. Anyway, what I was really interested in was not so much the nanobubbles themselves, but how they um, interact with nanoparticles. And this is what I was interested in. Uh, nanoparticles have a very high surface tension as well. And if they encounter a nanobubble, they will bind to it. The hydrophobic forces can actually overcome differences in charge between the nanobubble and the nanoparticle. In other words, if I have a particle that's minus 5 millivolts, it'll still bond uh, or bind to our nanobubbles, which are minus 30 millivolts or more. So, uh, so this hydrophobic force at this scale, size scale, is really powerful. Now, <clears throat> these particles may not be stable. They may be embryos. They're just, they could be at the solubility limit of this solid, and they could just be forming and dissolving over time, you know? But if they bind to a nanobubble, their surface tension is gonna go down and they're gonna become stable. And if we keep doing that, we can force the concentration of that solid to below the solubility limit. Here's some freeze fracture replica uh, images of some nanobubbles and nanoparticles that were published by Uchida and his group. And uh, you can see here, this is for 1% uh, sodium chloride. So these are sodium chloride nanoparticles here. And you can see that some of them are binding to this, nano, or seem to be binding to this nanobubble. This is without the, the nanobubbles. This is just with the nanoparticles. This is with the sodium chloride without the nano nanobubbles. So here you can see the nanobubbles, pretty clear distinction. And you can see the nanoparticles are binding to them. They also did the same thing with wastewater. And of course, with wastewater, you're going to have lots of nanoparticles. And you can see around this nanobubble, there are a lot of um, nanoparticles bound to that nanobubble. Which makes sense because the, these nanoparticles would be very hydrophobic. So we wanted to test this in a, a you know basic research uh, study, and we used uh, an, an instrument called the NanoSight. It's another scattered light system that you can measure uh, nanoparticles and nanobubbles together. The nice thing about this uh, NanoSight is it also gives you the relative intensity of the scattering center that's producing the light. So it can not only measure its size, but it also, also can measure its, uh, the intensity of the light coming from it. If we take deionized water and just put calcium carbonate in it, we, we would get one peak 
in the object size. This is at the solubility limit of the calcium carbonate, very low, 0 0.005 molar. Um, and we get one peak in relative intensity. We get one peak in object size, what you'd expect with just calcium carbonate. When we put the nanobubbles in, same water, uh, we get three peaks. We get a high peak, which is apparently the nanoparticles because they have higher index of refraction. They should scatter light more. The nanobubbles are probably this peak here, the low peak. And then we have this big peak in the middle that goes out to larger sizes. We believe those are the cl clusters. Those are clusters of nanobubbles and nanoparticles together. And they go out to much lar larger sizes. It's hard to see on this uh, image, but they do go out to larger sizes. So here's, here's the theory for the interaction of nanobubbles and nanoparticles. Uh, you put, you've got something at the solubility limit. That's typically where you're going to be at in one of these surface water systems because if there's more calcium carbonate in the water, it's going to deposit somewhere, and, and the concentration will go back down the solubility limit. If there's not enough uh, calcium carbonate in the water, then something will dissolve. The calcium carbonate will dissolve somewhere and bring the concentration back up. So you're typically around the solubility limit of that compound in the water when you have it depositing on the pipes, when it's fouling. If you add nanobubbles, you're going to form clusters. Those clusters are going to stabilize these embryos over here, and they're going to keep them from dissolving back in solution. And you're going to force the concentration below the solubility limit. If you keep adding more and more nanobubbles to this, the concentration won't be able to catch up. You can keep it down, and you can keep dissolving the fouling solid that you got in the system by just adding more and more nanobubbles this way. All right, we did some experiments to check this. Here's Here we took some solid calcium carbonate. Uh, we added um, a DI water. We put DI water in this. We uh, put nanobubbles in some of our experiments. We had untreated controls, and after 20, 20 hours, you can see the mass loss of the calcium carbonate was 0.59 here. Uh, for the untreated control, it was 0.35. This is another, this is uh, nanobubbles created from the gas pressure rate, a little bit higher, but not that much compared to the EMF system. After 72 hours, we had a mass loss of uh, 1.57 grams. And in the DI untreated water, we had 0.04, not much change here. Now we do we should we expected some loss uh, because we start out with DI water. There's no calcium carbonate to begin with, so you're going to dissolve some calcium carbonate just to bring the concentration up to solubility limit in the in the control. So that that we expected, but it wasn't nearly as high as the mass loss we saw with the nanobubbles, especially with AMF. So this is our strategy. Um, we form these clusters. We can force the effective concentration of the solute um, down below the solubility limit and start dissolving it uh, as much as we want, as long as we can keep adding more and more nanobubbles. Uh, we checked this, uh, see if this would work with cadaver arteries that had a plaque. In this case, instead of calcium carbonate, we had calcium phosphate in the plaque. And uh, we measured the size of the plaque using um, IV OCT uh, in Zhongping Chen's lab here in biomedical engineering and before and after adding uh, nanobubbles to the artery. So here, here we put, took our ex vivo, these are for cadavers, artery sample. We ran a ringer solution, which is a uh, intravenous fluid through, um, through the artery. So it had the same approximate concentration as blood and of, of salt and other additives, and, uh, and also nanobubbles in some cases. And so we wanted to see if the nanobubbles could actually lead to a greater dissolution of the plaque. And in fact, we did find that. Uh, this is after uh, two, four, and six hours for a, one, of our, one of the arteries that we were testing. Uh, and you can see uh, quite a bit of change here in terms of the change in volume, reduction in volume of that plaque. This was in a control <coughs> artery, very similar. Again, we were using Ringer solution without phosphate in it, so we did expect some 
a little bit of uh, reduction in the plaque in that solution, but it wasn't nearly as much as uh, with the nanobubbles. And here we did it again. Uh, this is for three hours. This is after, uh, I'm sorry, four hours with nanobubbles for five different samples. Uh, this is five control samples. And again, big difference in reduction of that plaque. We've also been recently um, talking to some people who set up a test system in Rialto. Um, th they're hopefully going to be working with me and Diego Rosso in the future with DOE funding. This was just a pilot project they, that they were able to do with some money from, I think, the CEC. And uh, they were able to set up two uh, systems over here uh, for treating wastewater with RO, with re reverse osmosis. Uh, they have two AMAS systems. One is a dummy system. One just has a empty cord, no magnets in it. Uh, the other one has magnets. And here are your RO membranes over here. Uh, and they were able to actually increase the life of the membranes without maintenance uh, by a factor of five with the active nanobubble generating AMS system. So that was very promising. So we're now working with them on a proposal to DOE uh, to continue working on this for reverse osmosis. And this is where I think uh, we can have a big impact on water purification desalination is because like pipes, uh, RO membranes and other fine filters also get fouled and get clogged up and have to be cleaned or replaced after a certain period of time. The more frequent that is, the more expensive it is, of course, to run the plant. And so in conclusion, I just want to say nanobubbles naturally becomes very stable under ionic repulsion pressure that balances surface tension pressure. That's our theory. Um, it constitutes a hybrid object made of gas containing a 2D ionic solid. It's really kind of like a solid around the liquid, the, that ionic shell. And the nanobubbles can be produced easily and plentifully by multiple methods including uh, this alternating magnetic field generation method that doesn't require any external power, just flowing water. And experiments have shown that treating water and other aqueous solutions with nanobubbles leads to formation of stable clusters with embryonic nanoparticles that can drive dissolution of undesirable fouling deposits. And so with that, I will conclude and take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Jim, thank you. That was great. Really good job. The theory the uh, experimental work and the application really nicely done and really appreciate it. We've got some time for questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll take them one at a time. Uh, I had a quick question, Jim. Uh, sure. Where do you see, uh, you mentioned at the end some of the applications with respect to uh, reverse osmosis membranes for desalination, I assume also for wastewater recycling. Uh, are there any specific places other than Rialto in California and the work you're doing where some of this nanobubble work is being applied to those issues anywhere that you're aware worldwide? Uh, I, I know people are, are working with systems that generate nanobubbles, particularly in Japan, as I mentioned, and they've tried to do all kinds of things in, in, uh, in addition to you know, what we've been trying to do with RO. Um, and I think in general, the results have been pretty good, but there just hasn't been a concerted, coordinated effort, I think, you know, to combine all of the data being generated out there. A lot of it's proprietary, of course, uh, not, all, not all, all of it's being published. Uh, but I know that there are other people uh, working on this and uh, and starting to get good results. I think with our theory and the way we measure nanobubble concentrations, we probably have a good chance of being better at optimizing some of these approaches. And that's where I'd like to really make a contribution is, uh, okay, you're creating nanobubbles, but how do you know you have the best and concentration of nanobubbles? Or how do you know you can't create a higher concentration? Or do you need a higher concentration? Or is that detrimental for some reason? So there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered. 
uh, so far, people have just been throwing nanobubble generators at things and seeing what happens. And, you know, that's not real science. It's, uh, it's not even really good engineering. And so right. uh, I think there's a lot of room now for really perfecting the methods so that we can optimize what we're doing with these things. Excellent. Well, we've got a question from your colleague and mine, Bill Cooper, and I'll go ahead and read it for you. Have you thought about yeah. removing O2 and putting another gas? N2O, for example, or maybe argon. Yeah, we ha we have uh, thought about that. Others have thought about. It. You can find publications on that. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that could be done uh, with different gases. Uh, we we actually have been looking at um, putting iodine vapor in uh, it, with mixing it with air in nanobubbles. Um, turns out that seems to be a very good antimicrobial. Probably because bacteria have adapted to exploit air containing nanobubbles. And, and when they get one that contains iodine vapor, <laughs> they, they start to get, try to get the air and they, it kills them. So that, that's been something we started to study uh, with a system, uh, which I have in my lab now, that, that can put iodine vapor in. But there are other gases. And uh, one thing we, we did with the AMF I didn't mention was we um, were able to take uh, dissolved helium and dissolved nitrogen and dissolved oxygen in water where we controlled we controlled the gases that the water was being exposed to instead of just aerated water we took out the air and we put in nitrogen helium and oxygen we found out with amf the highest concentration of nanobubbles were with the nitrogen so it appears that the nitrogen in, in air is what is primarily being used to generate the nanobubbles with AMF. That's but that's the gas that's coming out and precipitating right. uh, to form the nanobubbles with that system. So that system is pretty much limited to whatever you have dissolved in the water. Uh, but uh, you know, with the other systems, uh, the Nakuni pump and that uh, that little uh, uh, con container system, uh, you could put just about any gas in, in there and produce nanobubbles with that gas. So there's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot of opportunity, I think, a lot of applications that could be done uh, with different gases. You're right, Bill. Mm -hmm. Very good. I only have so many t we hours in a day, so questions. I can't do everything. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to explore all these things, but you know, you can only do so much. Yeah, it's a good start. While we're waiting for some other questions, I had another one. Uh, that I've been pondering during your presentation. You mentioned the funding from the Department of Energy. I assume there's also, or should be, interest from um, EPA, um, perhaps uh, water agencies here in California or elsewhere. Where do you think the future of research funding in this uh, domain will come from? And what will it take to spark greater interest? Uh, it's a good question. And um, one thing I have noticed about the more local agencies is they tend to be much more conservative a little a little more stodgy uh in terms of uh wanting to continue using the conventional methods um although we you know the the this test bed in rialto was funded by the state uh and i think i can't remember which i think it was a water resource board or something like that that funded it I wasn't in actually involved in that because it wasn't enough money for me to be involved in. But um, they did, they were able to set up this uh, skid uh, to test the uh, AMF systems there, and uh, and so that was that was fairly uh, you know progressive. Um, but they had a lot of help from the city of Rialto. The mayor of Rialto, in particular, was very uh, positive on on doing this. So, you know. Uh, local governments, I, I, I don't know how far you're going to be able to get with them. They don't have as much money, of course, and, and they tend not to be so uh, far thinking, I, I would say, in terms of new techniques like this. Uh, I think it's going to have mm -hmm. to come from the federal government. But again, they have to be convinced that there's a real scientific rationale for this and, and, a, and a good theory for explaining this. That's why we wanted, that's why I wanted to have a good theory for why these things exist, because there really wasn't one. 
Yeah, and one of the comments that was added, uh, I think, by Bill uh, in the chat is that uh, Orange County Water District, which is, of course, our wholesaler wholesale provider here in Orange County, has a lot of RO membranes, and they might be a good local partner. It's a great suggestion. They're certainly heavily invested in uh, recycled wastewater through the groundwater replenishment system. Yeah. So just something yeah. to think about. Yeah, it is. And Diego Rosso has been working with them some. And I know Diego is very much uh, for this uh, research. He, he's been working with me. He actually has one of his PhD students in my lab uh, doing some work. Uh, so we're already starting to get uh, the pieces. And he would probably be working with this group that had the skid in Rialto. He's probably going to be with us on that uh, if we if we get funded from DOE. So Diego knows he has the connections uh, with with the Orange County uh, Water Authority and other water authorities, uh, as you know, Bill and, and and David, and so I think I think I'll be in good shape if I just rely on him to make those connections. But uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody about this. Great, uh, kind of related question. Uh, one of the things that's implicit in your presentation is the need to. Uh, I suppose, build confidence within right. people in the water sector that this is a set of technologies and the science behind it that could be extraordinarily efficient and useful and efficacious in a number of ways. Uh, you, you sort of implied this in terms of the, you mentioned the conservatism of agencies. Uh, what do you think it might take looking down the road to build confidence and trust in the water sector, that this is something worth to invest in and worth partnering with UCI and others? Yeah, I think uh, two things. W one is we need good demonstration projects like the one in Rialto to, to just show people, look, you know, you know, it's hard to argue with that. Um, if they'll believe we did the test, you know, appropriately and everything, but, you know, you never know. There's skeptics everywhere. But I think the other the other problem is communication. Uh, you know, it's getting the message uh, to enough people uh, who can make decisions that are going to make this go. And what I found is it's really hard to get your message out there to a, a large number of people. And I think one of the problems is, first of all, I, I'm not a water guy and I don't Go to I don't naturally go to the kinds of meetings that I probably should be going to to talk about this. And so a lot of people haven't heard my message. And, uh, you know, I still find publications out there coming out on other theories of nanobubble stability that aren't as good as ours, and they don't reference our work. So, our, you know, our paper's out there, but not everybody's reading it, of course. And uh, I don't know, we, there's so many... Uh, distractions on the internet, you know, things coming at us from all different directions now. Uh, you know, we can't rely on a publication, even in a good journal like we published in, uh, to make a huge impact because, you know, not many people are going to read it, uh, unfortunately. And so I, I need to go to more conferences. Uh, I need, and I've given Diego some slides. Hopefully he'll, and I know he'll use them. But we need to get the, the message out that, you know, look, this has got some really good evidence for what it's doing. And uh, it's worth it's worth trying. You know, it's worth worth doing some exploration to see if see if this will work for your for your particular situation. So, uh, so that that's I think that those are the two problems. You know, <laughs> um, I, I'm not in the right groups all the time to, to be giving this message out and. Uh, and so I don't do that naturally. And the other problem is just even if you are in those groups to get make it a, a concerted, you know, impactful message that reaches a lot of people. It's not as easy as it used to be, seems like. No, it isn't. And in Water UCI, we certainly understand that we've had the good fortune of being able to work with a number of agencies on topics comparable to this. Along those lines, Bill had another great suggestion that Orange County Water District has a great R&D group. Maybe if you gave a talk to them, you could extend the RO. And I think they'd be interested. And we do have some connections 
down the road, Jim, if you're interested, we'll uh, put you in touch with some of the, the great folks at OCWD. It occurs to me also, building on uh, Bill's comment, uh, the Met Metropolitan Water District, Southern California, I would think might be interested in this, particularly as they move forward with uh, greater uh, robustness on recycled and reused race water. Uh, and then I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, this talk is being recorded, and in a few days we will have a link posted to the Water UCI website for those that want to revisit it or haven't had the opportunity, and please share with your friends and colleagues about this talk. Um, yeah, again, great job. We're just about... Well, thank you, David. Up. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. This was wonderful. And well, like I said, a fascinating yeah. topic. Well, this is this this is the kind of webinar I need to be on, and uh, I'm going to be trying to do more of them in the future. And I think with your help and Diego's help, we will get the word out. Maybe Bill will be able to help too. I don't know. I think Bill would be well equipped to help. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, thanks we'll, everybody we'll for coming. We'll do our on. best. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, great, and uh, thank you, UCI Water UCI staff, Cheng Duck and Kayla for all of your work, and Han Parker with the School of Social Ecology, which is where our center is headquartered. Uh, stay tuned. We will have additional colloquia coming up later this year, and we'll uh, send out a couple of email blasts on that soon. So again, Jim Ruthman, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.